Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is Apollo 8. And here to talk to us about this is one of our AFE members, Kevin Medden. Hi, Kevin. Welcome back to the Thanks, Don. Show. Great to be here. Apollo 8. Apollo 8. It's uh, the space race. Yeah. And it starts with the paperclip, of all things. A paperclip. Please yes. explain. In the late 1944 to 1945, obviously the war in Europe was winding down. Yes. And yes, the Soviets were on our side, but were they really our allies? So the OSS, which was the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, created an Operation Paperclip. And their idea was, let's kidnap, and I'm using that word facetiously, as many German scientists as we can before the Soviets get them, because obvious, because of the, the V-2 and the V-1 um, rocketry that the Germans had, they were obviously just a little bit ahead of us. Exactly, exactly. So this operation was meant to kidnap, as we're saying here, <laughs> as many of the German rocket scientists as uh, we could get our hands on. Right, and for those who are wondering, did we get anybody any good? Well, the answer is yes. We got Werner von Braun. Yes. Obviously the father of, well, I mean, Goddard was considered the father of rocketry, but if you're going to talk about strictly American, you know, space goals, it would be Werner von Braun. Von Braun, exactly. And there were others as well. Like right. So they, basically, they all moved to Huntsville, Alabama, which is where the missile thing was for NASA, because we were making the transition from NACA. Well, NASA doesn't come into the late 50s, but anyways... They, so essentially, most of the 40s and 50s was a lot more rocket testing. Okay. So we didn't hear a whole lot about who was ahead, but think about it. Why would you want a rocket? Did you really want to go to the moon in 1948? Well, you know, science well, fiction maybe. Right, but, yeah. but most people were thinking more in terms of, man, if I could get my nuclear warhead on a rocket, I can wipe them out before they wipe me out. That's you know, a, a sad commentary on society, but that's where we were then. Right. You wanted to have yours before they got theirs. So, you know, everything was going, quote, unquote, according to Hoyle. And then, oh, my gosh, Sputnik. Ah, yes. Sputnik, 1957. 57. And all of a sudden, you know, all the naysayers in America, oh, my God, we're behind the Soviets. They're, they could put a spy up there, and they would know everything we're doing. And, of course, we tried to answer in kind with our own liftoff. Well, instead of Sputnik, we got Flopnik. And the Soviets at one time said, Comrade America, maybe we could show you how to put satellite into space. Well, obviously, yeah. anybody in Washington that's in this ideological battle with the Soviets, they're not buying that. Exactly. So exactly. we finally get it right, and we get Explorer 1. Right. And, and the interesting yeah. thing about Explorer 1 is it actually had a scientific payload in it, not just putting a apparatus into space, what we call a satellite. So the, the payload was by Dr. James Van Allen out of Iowa, and he is now famous for the Van Allen radiation belts. That's how we discovered them. Correct. And, and obviously, those of us who like to tan in the sun appreciate having the... Uh, Radiation belts keeping some of the dangerous stuff away. Not all of it, but some of it. But some, sure. So we had uh, Sputnik by the, uh, the Soviets, and then uh, the U.S. had Explorer. Uh, I remember as a youngster, some communication satellites, Telstar. Right. And they would put in the paper when it was going to be going over. So we could all run outside and look up into the sky and see that little point of light <laughs> just tracking across the nighttime sky. Right, so essentially what, what happens then is the press calls it a space race. But it's not really that. It's more of this ideological struggle between what we perceive as the Eastern world or the communist world versus what, what people call Western democracy. We build it as good versus evil. So at Rice University... What triggered the whole Mercury, Gemini, Apollo program was the speech by John Kennedy where he said, essentially, we are going to put a man at, to the moon, land him there safely, and return him home safely by 
the end of the decade, which means by 1969. Right. Well, the, the, you know, right here you're thinking, well, what are we going to do? And then Gagarin hits us. Again, Soviets number one, U.S. zero. Right. Now they, again, they were first. It, but we believed in doing things incrementally. So even when Shepard goes up, Shepard is a suborbital flight. But again, we want an increments. We're not ready to go all the way until we get to, until we get to, well, that's Alan Shepard right there. We had those reversed, I believe. But anyways, Shepard goes first in the suborbital, and then Glenn finally becomes our Gagarin, where he gets up into space and does the, the orbits. So at this point, everything's equal. The rest of the Mercury program for us is a success. And again, because of increments, we decide we're going to go to Gemini. So we go from a one-man capsule to a two, and Gemini accomplishes a lot of the idiosyncratic things like how to dock in space and the various things we knew that we had to do before we could even consider going to the moon. Because, you know, let's refresh people's memories really quick. You don't shoot the rocket straight to the moon and have it come straight back. No. There's, there's a complex geometry here. Exactly. And when the, when the, guy, when the young man named Herbalt told NASA how they were supposed to do it, do the you know, orbit around the Earth, and then do the figure eight pattern to orbit around the moon. When he first told them that, they said, no, 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 you're a crackpot. We're not going to do it this way. And yet, after the engineers reanalyzed the data points, you know, this is what they came up with. So the third part of the triad was going to be Apollo. And that was going to be the, the our vehicle was going to have you know, a three-man capsule. So here we are, 1966, things appear to be, you know, moving relatively smoothly, you know. We look like we're on target. And then the engineers decided to do what they called a plugs-out test. And these three gentlemen you see here, uh, White, uh, Grissom, and Roger Chafee, are the crew of Apollo 1. Now this plugs-out test takes place on the ground in the Apollo 1 capsule. Because again, the, the engineers need all their data points, so they want everything to go well. Well, Grissom's getting upset. He can't hear through his, you know, his uh, sound system. Mm -hmm. So he yells and screams, and he says, if you can't talk to me from the blockhouse back to here without this being garbled, how are you going to talk to a man on the moon? So at this point, he hangs a lemon in one of the windows of the capsule. And he's really frustrated. But the engineers are adamant, we need this data. we got to keep doing this test. So, you know, everybody's frustrated. They're, you know, their nerves are shot. And then they hear probably the worst words you could hear. And we pretty much attribute it to Roger Chafee, where he says, fire, we're on fire, get us out of here. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads to a whole other issue. What did the engineers put inside the capsule as far as, you know, what form of breathing, you know, material. Pure oxygen. Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the problem. We weren't smart enough to know if you mixed it with a little nitrogen, it would be safer. Then we found a second problem, and it's not good to find problems when you have a fire. But the second problem is, oops, the door opens the wrong way. Rather than somebody on the outside being able to grab a handle and pull out to allow egress, it went in, and you know by the, and of course people outside the pad are scared stiffless. You know they're, they're scared and they don't know what to do. And before they know it, in pure oxygen, we have you know we now have three American heroes. Yeah, yep, that was a very tragic moment. I I remember it. And you know there's no sense in rehashing the hows and whys, but they you know we figured out that maybe our engineering wasn't up to snuff, and maybe the contractors weren't building things to the tolerances that they were designed for. Exactly, exactly. Well, this has been a very interesting segment one of this program. Uh, if you have a question, send us an email. We always like looking at those on this topic or really any other that uh, you're interested in. And coming up next is Term of the Month with Stephen. Thanks, Don. The term of the month is Equigravisphere. 
Echogravosphere is a term that NASA used uh, to talk about the point at which the spacecraft is equally attracted by gravity to the Earth and to the Moon. And it's, it's uh, a sphere because it, it's, not, um, it's not just a point like a, a Lagrange point. It's, a, it's a, a sort of surface. They call it a sphere. Um, so the spacecraft crosses the echogravosphere on its journey to or from the Moon. Now, NASA uses the Earth for coordinates um, if the spacecraft is closer to the Earth than the Moon. And when it crosses to being closer to the Moon from a gravity perspective, then it uses lunar coordinates, uses the Moon for coordinates. Now, since the Moon orbits the Earth, uh, when this happens, there's a change in the way that velocity is reported because you're now moving, you're now uh, reporting versus uh, a, a different frame, a uh, different frame of reference. So this confused the press who thought that there was some sort of a barrier that the astronauts could feel. There is no such thing. It's, it's totally smooth. And in fact, the astronauts joked about it. Now, I was 9 or 10, and I wasn't confused. Now, this could be because the press got it right after all, or maybe I listened to Walter Cronkite, Cronkite. or maybe I was really smart, though usually it's the 13-year-old who knows everything, uh, or I didn't really think much about it. And that's the term of the month, equigravosphere. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. Welcome back to the program. We're talking about Apollo 8, and uh, I'm here with Kevin Medden, one of our AFE team members, to talk about this uh, interesting space flight. So, 1968. Crazy year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Think about it. It starts off with a bang, with the Tet Offensive, which was the major Viet Cong, North Vietnamese offensive to try to convince the American public as well as the American government that the war in Vietnam was unwinnable. So that so we start out being frustrated by that. In fact, that was the um, the offensive where it, it allowed Cronkite to go to um, Vietnam and Cronkite comes back to CBS News and says, we're going to lose. And that's when Johnson says, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the American people. Exactly, yes. So then, of course, that leads us to Martin Luther King being assassinated as well as J or, um, RFK. Right, from so April to had, June, yeah. yeah. So we're all on pins and needles, and we're you know, halfway, not even halfway through the summer. And then what we affectionately call the Democratic National Convention, or a.k.a. a riot. Oh, take, in Chicago, yeah. Yeah, it takes place in yeah. Chicago. And so, you know, we're not really happy, unless you live in southeastern Michigan, obviously. You're quite happy with 68 because... Uh, a certain baseball team won the World Series that year. Tigers beat the Cardinals. After trailing three games to one. So anyways, you know, NASA's keeping an eye on, you know, getting Apollo back up to and running because obviously we had to go over everything. And it's been 18 months since the fire when we finally get Apollo 7 off. Well, a little bit before Apollo 7 goes off, Frank Borman, Lovell, and Anders, our intrepid crew, they're in a... Uh, uh, California checking out their spacecraft, making sure the changes that the um, engineers were supposed to install and have been, you know, put in correctly. Frank gets a phone call. Get your butt back to uh, Houston. So he hops on his T-38, which is the Air Force trainer, which the astronauts fly to stay proficient for their flight rating. Flies back to Houston. Ha doesn't have a clue what they're going to tell him. And he says, Frank, and Frank's a cold warrior. Cold War warrior. So he's the anti-Russian, as anti-Russian you can be. He said, Frank, CIA claims that Russia's ahead of us, and um, they could be getting to the moon before we do, and we can't have that happen. How would you like to go to the moon with Apollo 8? And Frank, like, looks at him and says, well, what do you think? You know, like, you're asking me to do something that every astronaut wants to do. Knowing full well he's probably out of the rotation for 11, which they were all assuming was going to be the moon landing. So anyways, Apollo 7 is a success. It only goes up with the Saturn 1B. So at this point in time, the full stack 
which is the Saturn V that's going to take us to the moon, has, a, has been tested but with no men in it. So nobody has actually sat on that sucker and felt the ride and gotten any feedback as to what's going to happen. So think about it. You're, 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 the, you're astronauts. You're paid to do this, but are you really going to go in that thing and be happy about it? Well, as we all know, they did eventually blast off you know, and, and get into space. And uh, there we go. See, we, we eventually we did blast off, and we did get into space. So most of the, if you could say routine, most of this thing was routine. You know, everything was pretty good for them. They had a few glitches. Frank Borman had a cold, and he tried to hide it from NASA so they wouldn't, you know, cancel the, the flight plan, as it were. But the funny part about rocketry is you need these little burns occasionally to help circularize an orbit and different things. Well, guess what? Every burn they had to do when they finally make it to the moon, guess where the, where the burn takes place? Far side of the moon. Ah. So, you know, eventually they finally get into orbit, and this is what we see there, Don. The far side of the moon for the very first time, a photo taken by one of the astronauts, Bill Anders. So the first thing you notice when you look at this photo is not a lot of Mario, but a heck of a lot of damage via the craters. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Of course, I was supposed to put my Pink Floyd pun in there because there is no dark side. That, but. that is correct. But and the next shot here is just a, a classic low-level orbit shot, and this is where you know Borman is getting frustrated with his companions. He's like, you know, quit staring out the window. We've got a job to do, and you know, Lovell and Anders are saying, we may never pass this way again. Let us. You know, let us have our fun. So the mission essentially is a success, and we should reiterate it is going up during Christmas time. And if you recall correctly, most of the Apollo missions, because you know we are paying for it, we that being the taxpayers, they do a lot of television. So Frank has been stewing over this for months. Like, what do I talk about on TV? And then he finds out he's going up during Christmas. So finally, after talking to, and here's a shot of Frank, by the way, of, you know, inside of the uh, command module. And, you know, he doesn't know what to do, and he finally talks it over with a couple of priests, rabbis, and whatever, and they settle on the Genesis reading. So you might remember, they have the television footage where they're orbiting the moon, and we're seeing this stark, you know, lunar surface for the first time up close, and they're getting this Genesis reading. And I don't know about you, but being a Catholic, that really got to me. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's when we had the Genesis crisis because, you know. People were upset yeah, that there was a religious. You know, Madeline O'Hara calls up and says, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, nonetheless, you know, this, this is what happened. And so, you know, everything's going, like, really, really good. But guess what? We have to do another burn on the far side of the moon. And it's Christmas Day. And, you know, engineers have this pretty well timed out. They know when they're going to get the reacquisition of signal. So I believe it was Charlie Duke was the uh, Capcom at the time. And he's like, Apollo 8, Houston. Waits a while. Apollo 8, Houston. Waits again. Apollo 8, Houston. No answer. Engineers are like, and everybody, you know, in Houston's like, we should be hearing them for now. What the heck went wrong now? Finally, as we all know, Jim's, James Lovell, he was probably the, I, I call him the comedic astronaut. He comes on the air and he says, Houston, I'm here to tell you there is a Santa Claus. Meaning, of course, that the burn went well and everything is fine, so getting back to Earth shouldn't be a problem. Because obviously, if the burn didn't get the capsule lined up correctly, it would have changed the parameters of reentry, and God knows you don't want to change those because you may miss the cone of opportunity that you need to slide into. Plus having the, the rescue ship in the right place. Correct. But I think most Americans, you know, are frustrated with a 1968 by now. You know, we've had enough of this, everything going wrong. Yeah, other than the Tigers. 
Right. It was a very tough year. So two things really stood out in the Apollo 8 mission for me. Number one was the Earthwise photo. Probably the iconic picture of all pictures that astronauts have taken from space. Are some more interesting? Probably yes. From a scientific value, were some more scientifically? Probably yes. But for the first time, you are seeing our planet that supports our life rising above another surface. This is a very visceral image. I mean, even the post office has used it on, you know, image, images for postage stamps. Correct. And then the one final thing to wrap up this whole celebration of the um, 50th anniversary of Apollo 8, NASA gets a, a telegram from a, you know, the average Joe, you know, American, and he says, would you please thank the three astronauts of Apollo 8 for saving 1968? And I thought that was a pretty poignant statement because it gives you the idea that not only are we incrementally getting closer to our goal of, la goal of landing a man on the moon, but we're, we're having an impact now in a year that needed some positivity. That's right. But I've got one question for you. Could Apollo 8 have landed on the moon? The answer to that question is unequivocally, despite what you may read, the answer is no. Minor, yes. te minor technicality. The LEM, or the Lunar Excursion Module, at that time, which I'll remind you, is December 1968, it's not even man-rated yet. Grumman is still working on it. So they didn't have it. It was an empty cavity, essentially, where the LEM would have been, you know, for 9, 10, and 11. Oh, my. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So from, yes, the end of 68 to July of 69. It would, be, it would be the 9 and 10 guys that would be the ones that would have been more, you know, technically had the ability to cheat and try to be the first ones on it. But obviously you're not going to. You'll no. never get back up again. Well, that's it. You that's know, it. They, they would never allow you back in space if you would have pulled that stunt. That's for sure. You've got a couple of books here with you. Yes. The, uh, the first book here is by Jeffrey Kluger called, affectionately enough, Apollo 8. And if you're not familiar with the author, Jeffrey Kluger, he did write Apollo 13. So this okay. isn't his first rodeo when it comes to writing about the Apollo program. And the second one is from Robert Kirsten, and it's called Rocket Men. And if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend it because he does analyze the political aspects of what we discussed, but he puts the whole mission in the context of the year the way you and I have accomplished in this program. Great program. I was fascinated by the whole space program, grew up with it. Uh, I want to thank you, Kevin, for bringing us this uh, interesting uh, information here in the uh, year of Apollo, the 50th anniversary of 2019. Um, please visit our website. We have the uh, address down there at uh, the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next to finish up the show is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for January 2019? The sun rises at 8.02 in the morning and sets at 5.11 at the beginning of the month and rises at 7.47 and sets at 5.46 by the end of the month. So the, month, the days are already getting longer. Uh, astronomical night starts and stop, uh, stops just a little over an hour and a half uh, before and after sunrise and sunset. The moons, uh, the month starts with the new moon on the 5th, the first quarter on the 14th. Uh, the full moon on the 21st, that's perigee when the moon is closest to the Earth, so the moon is bigger in the sky, a super moon, if you will. It's only a little bit. And then the third quarter is on the 27th. Now, Mercury here on January 1st at 7.10 a.m. is 
It goes from Ophiuchus to Capricornus. It rises at the beginning of the month at 6.57 a.m. Uh, and it is best then at the beginning of the month because we have superior conjunction. That's when the sun is between us and, and Mercury on the 29th. Mercury zips around the sun in just 88 days. Jupiter goes from Ophiuchus, um, it is in Ophiuchus all month, so Ophiuchus is a big part of these first three planets. It rises at 416 to 424, not very much difference over the month. It has to do with the weird geometry that we're looking at. And it's best uh, about an hour before sunrise, uh, any time of the month. Venus goes from Libra, Libra to Ophiuchus and rises again, 416 to 454. It's not that much different. It's, you know, uh, a little over half hour. Uh, it's best maybe three quarters of an hour after Venus itself rises. Uh, it has max western elongation on January 6th. And then we have uh, Mars, Uranus, and Neptune on January 1st at 8 p.m. So this is evening sky. Uh, Mars is in Pisces. It sets at 11.49 p.m. to 11.35. It's best an hour after sunset. Uranus is in Pisces also, and it sets at 2.15 a.m. to just 18 minutes after midnight, and it's best two hours after sunset. Neptune is in Aquarius, where it always is, and it sets um, at 10.22 p.m. to 8.29 p.m. over the course of the month, and again, best two hours after sunset. Uh, you'll need at least binoculars for Neptune uh, and a good sky chart. Now, we haven't mentioned Saturn, and that's because on September, on, on, uh, on uh, the 2nd of January, we have uh, superior conjunction, and that's when Saturn is on the other side of the sun from the Earth. So if you draw a line here, on this is uh, this, the, the 5th of January, but if you, if you sort of draw a line from, the, from Saturn to the center of that box for the outer solar system, and you go more or less in the same direction in the little box from the sun to Earth, it, um, uh, they line up. So Pluto, it turns out, is, has superior conjunction on the 11th, uh, so you can kind of see Saturn and Pluto are kind of lined up here. And um, so this is not a very good uh, month for either Saturn or Pluto. And that's what's up in the night sky for January 2019. Remember, we don't charge uh, for our show. The show is free, but we may tax your brain.